Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. And again, it's good to have everybody back. And uh, for those of you on television, when I begin that way, I'm speaking of the fact that we come in once a month for these taping sessions. And we tape four programs in succession. And uh, I always want folk to know that because you're going to see these same faces, these same colored clothes for a month. But uh, it's about the only way we can uh, cope with all the demands on our time is to do all of this one time a month. So anyway, for those of you on television, we welcome you and how we do appreciate all your letters and your phone calls, as well as your financial help, because after all, anytime you go on the air, it does take money. And we always like folk to know that no one, not even our good bookkeeper and her husband, and it's good to have Margaret and Harold with us again today, they don't take a dime for all of their work. And my little wife over here, uh, spends almost every forenoon just answering the phone and filling orders and uh, she doesn't even take any compensation and you all know I don't. I, I just wouldn't feel right by ever taking anything for what the Lord has given me. But anyway, uh, all of these past programs, for those of you that are probably catching our program for the first time, all our programs are available on videotape wherein we have put 12 half-hour programs on one six-hour tape. And we finally had to go up a little bit, and I hated to, but uh, for those of you who are ordering them by mail, in order to lessen the burden of postage, we've raised our cost to $30 for a six-hour tape. Now, I guess that's still a pretty good bargain compared to costs of most other videos. But if you're interested in uh, all the program material that you've missed, if you've just recently tuned in, you write us or call us on the 800 number, and uh, Iris is our secretary. I'm surprised that people call, and they're so shocked when either she or I answer the phone. Well, who else will? I mean, after all, uh, I told one day lady the other day, I said, when that 800 number rings, it's in our kitchen, and uh, you'll be talking to either me or to my wife, and uh, no secretaries and no banks of phones or anything like that. So anyway, we love to hear from you, and we'll get these tapes as well as the books. Now, book number seven, and we're going to pick it up from the printer this afternoon. So that means that one through seven are now available. And remember, the books also are just a transcription from those six-hour tapes. In other words, book number one is a transcription of the number one six-hour tape and so forth. So we'd love to hear from you, and uh, we do appreciate the fact that they are being used in so many places, home Bible studies, Sunday schools, and what have you. All right, now I'm going to digress a little bit in this next half hour from our study in the Gospels. I'm probably going to go to the book of John next, and then go back and finish up what we have left off in Matthew, the post-resurrection 40 days. That's still left to be covered. But I wanted, before we started the book of John, to take you here in the studio, as well as our te television audience, back to the letters of Paul, because I've probably shook a few people up. In fact, I got a letter from one gentleman, and I, I, I appreciated that. Uh, he said, I love your program, and he says, I agree with most of what you teach. But every once in a while, he said, I fly up to that television and start talking back to it. And I couldn't help but remember a brother-in-law of mine up in Iowa who is an avid Green Bay Packer football fan. And one time we were watching a ball game with him and he sits in that recliner and anything happens that was contrary to the Packers and he flies out of that recliner and he goes all the way to that television set and he screams at the referee or he screams at somebody who fumbled. And then his redness kind of goes down and he goes back to his recliner and till the next episode, so I can just picture a few people doing that. Oh, Les says something, and they probably fly out of that recliner, and they go up that television set, and, oh, you're wrong. Well, that's their privilege, you know. But all I tell people, now, don't just scream at me and say I'm wrong until you check out the book, because hopefully this is what we're totally 
totally relying on. And so now what I'm going to do is take some points that Paul brings out in his epistles, and I want you to keep them in your memory bank so that when we go back to the Gospels, that you realize that none of this is back there. Now it all comes to a head. You don't throw the rest of the Bible away in order to study Paul, but you have to understand that so many of the things that Paul brings out in his letters are not back there in the Old Testament or even in Christ's earthly ministry or in the early book of Acts. All right, let's start with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll just look at the first four verses. And just constantly be reminding yourselves and making the comparison. Now, is anything like this back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Is anything like this back in the Old Testament? Well, I'll answer it for you. No. But I want you to be able to see it. All right, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, now remember he's writing to Gentile believers. Now, there were some Jews, of course, in all these congregations, but they're predominantly Gentile. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. In other words, you have to know what you believe. Now verse 3. For the apostle writes, I, speaking of himself, I delivered unto you first of all, not following in the footsteps of someone else, but he came to these Gentiles at Corinth first. How that first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And of course, that'd be the Old Testament. And that he was buried and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now that's the gospel. That is the purest form that you can find anywhere in the scriptures. The gospel for us is that Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. That's the gospel. All right. All of Paul's writings now will be pregnant with this theme. It just keeps coming up constantly. Whether he speaks of the all three or whether he just says that Christ rose from the dead, then of course it's implied that he died and was buried. All right. Now let's just stay in Corinthians for a little bit and come all the way back, if you will, to Corinthians chapter 1. And all I want you to see is that these statements prompted by the moving of the Holy Spirit through this apostle of the Gentiles, you will not find even in Christ's earthly ministry or any of his own words as he was dealing back there at that time. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. Oh, this shocks a lot of people. I didn't put it in here. The Holy Spirit did. And he says, for Christ sent me not to baptize. Now stop a minute. Why was John the Baptist sent? To baptize. To baptize. Absolutely, that was his ministry. He, he preached the baptism of repentance, no doubt about it. But Paul says, I'm not. Christ didn't send me to baptize like he did John. But what is his mission? Preach the gospel. What gospel? That Christ died, was buried, and rose again. All right, so to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. And then verse 18, for the preaching of the cross, death, burial, and resurrection, his shed blood, is to them that perish, that is the lost, what? Foolishness. I've even had people ask me here in the Bible Belt, well, what does something that took place 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem have to do with me? Hey, everything. It has everything to do with us. Because here is where God has his controversy with man. He has paid the sin debt. He has suffered our punishment. And he has opened the windows of heaven, if we'll just believe it, even though it happened 2,000 years ago. All right, so the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, is the power of God. Now, you see, salvation has to be an exercise of the sovereign power of an almighty God. 
That's why man can't work for his salvation. See, all man has is physical strength. But only God can bring about the salvation of the spiritual. And it has to be the power of God. All right, then come on down to verse 22. And I want you to remember this as we go back to the Gospels. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks, the philosophers, seek after wisdom. But, Paul says, we're not going to bother ourselves with either one. We're not going to be looking for signs, nor are we going to be looking for a new philosophy. What are we doing? But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them who are called, Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. All right, let's come on a little further to, oh my, there's so many in here, I don't even know where to stop. But let's go on up to uh, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. And drop in at verse 12. And again, Paul is just simply using a, a simple analogy, an il illustration of the human body. And all you have to do is think about yourself or look at your neighbor. How do we operate? Well, we have that central nervous system. We have the mind, which is the very core of all our being. And everything we say, think, or do originates up here in the head, in the mind. And then as a result, the nerve endings will respond. The whole body will function, but it all has its headquarters up here. All right, now Paul is using that as an illustration of the body of Christ, which is a new term. Again, you won't find that back in the Gospels. You never have Jesus referred to the body of Christ. It's a Pauline revelation. Now what does it say? Verse 12, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many, one body. And what's he saying? You have ten fingers, you have ten toes, you have eyes and ears, arms, legs. Those are all members of the body. But do we have twenty bodies? No, we have one. And they're all part and parcel of Now, then he goes into the next verse, and that's the body of Christ. Every believer around the world, regardless of their color, regardless of their denominational handle, if they're a believer, then, verse 13, for by one Spirit, capitalized, Holy Spirit, are we, how many? All, not just the super, super spiritual, not just those who have seemingly experienced some sort of a high, but all are baptized, not with water, but by the power of the Holy Spirit into how many bodies? One. My, I read the other day, yet there are, I don't know how many thousand denominations and cults in America alone. Thousands. Cults, denominations, and various groups. But the scripture only knows of one. And that is that composite of true born-again believers. They are members of the body. And how do we get there? by the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or by the Holy Spirit. And here it is, whether Jew or Gentile, bond or free, we have been all made to drink into that one Spirit. You gonna see language like that in the Gospels? No way, no way. All right, let's come on over to Romans. Back to Romans. Let's start in chapter 3. Language again that is just not in the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, you remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus? And he said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What was Jesus' answer? Keep the commandments. Keep the law. And indeed, within that was salvation for that time. And that's what you're seeing in the gospel accounts. 
that they were to keep the law. Now, of course, with the appearance of the Messiah, an added responsibility was to believe that he was the Christ. He was the fulfillment of all those Old Testament covenants. But it was still based on the Judea system of law. But now look what Paul says. By that there is no justification. For the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, I'm always pointing that out in our evening classes. The law does nothing, absolutely nothing, but condemn us. There is no power in the law to save anybody. There is no power in the law to do anything but condemn. And oh, how many people, again, even here in the Bible Belt, in Oklahoma, I run across them constantly. Well, I'm doing the best I can. I'm keeping the commandments. I think I'll make it. No, you won't. If you think it, you've already said you're not. Because as soon as you enter into the biblical salvation, you don't just think or hope you what? You know. Oh, that's right. Then you know, see. Now verse 21 in Romans 3. But now. But now. Now what does that little three-letter word but indicate? That there's been a change. See, there's a flip side here. We are no longer under that Judaic system of the law. Now we're under something totally different. But now the righteousness of God without the law. You see how plain that is? That isn't gobbledygook. My a sixth grader can read that. If you'll read it, can understand it. That without the law, yes, witnessed by the law and the prophets, but verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that repent and are baptized? No, doesn't say that. But upon all them that what? Believe. Believe. And believing is faith. Faith is trust. And then verse 23, of course, is that all-inclusive statement for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But even though we've come short of God's glory, he is able to justify us freely. Why? Because of what he has accomplished on the cross. All right, let's go on over to uh, chapter 5 in Romans. Oh, I even have to back up chapter 4. I throw my little wife a curve when I keep changing these references. But uh, anyway... She knows how I operate, and uh, that's, that's part of it. Romans 4, verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth, see? But believeth on him who justifies what kind of people? Ungodly. How many times... Haven't I, and perhaps you, I know Iris has. Oh, they'll say, if I can just clean up my act, if I could just quit my bad habit, uh, then I'd get saved. They're putting the cart before the horse. You can't clean up your own act. We have to let God do it, and then we respond. And that's exactly what Paul is writing, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justifies the ungodly. And then his faith is counted for righteousness. All right, now come over to Romans 5. Verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now stop and think. Even Christ in his earthly ministry, could he say something like that? Now he knew he was going to die. As we pointed out in the class last night, as he told the twelve up there in Luke 18, we go to Jerusalem and everything that's been written in the prophets about the Son of Man is going to happen. He's going to be scourged. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be put to death. He's going to be buried. And on the third day, he'll rise from the dead. He knew. But the next verse says what? And they, the twelve, understood none of these things. For it was hid from them. They didn't know he was going to die. And I always like to remind my classes, even after he died, he was crucified. Did those followers just sort of pick up their feelings and say, well, let's, let's just bide our time. He always said he'd be risen from the dead in three days. No. What'd they think? It was all done. 
Everything had gone down the tube. They didn't understand that he was going to raise from the dead. But see, now Paul can speak after the fact, and he says, that's what happened. He died for our sin. He was risen from the dead for our justification. And we receive all this by simply believing it. All right, verse 9 of that same chapter, much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, through his finished work of the cross. All right, just, just turn a few pages and come to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Oh, I could use just about the whole chapter, but I'm just going to stop, uh, drop all the way down to verse 11. I'm going to keep reminding you, as well as our television audience now, this is what you're not going to see back there in the Gospels, not even in John. Verse 11, But if the Spirit, capitalized, Holy Spirit, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth where? In you. Now, you don't get language like that back in the Gospels. But here Paul reveals that now in this age, when we become a child of God, the very presence of the Godhead in the person of the Holy Spirit not only raises us up out of our deadness in sin, but he indwells us. And that, of course, is why we no longer need the law. When I constantly say, you know, we're not under law, that doesn't mean we have license. That doesn't mean that we're now free to steal. Not at all. Quite the opposite. We're under the power now of a person of the Godhead who keeps us from all the things that the law demanded not to do, which the law couldn't. But see, now we have the power of the Holy Spirit that keeps us from wanting to steal. It keeps us from wanting to speak falsely. It keeps us from coveting. It keeps us from immoral doing. It keeps us from all these things. And now you see it up here in chapter 8, reading on in verse 14. And here, here, here's the secret of the Christian life, which the world can't understand. The world just can't comprehend it. They think that the reason we live the way we do is we're trying to make points with the Almighty. Oh, they're ignorant. That's not it at all. We can't make points with the Almighty. We can't do anything to merit his favor. But you see, we're responding to what he has done for us and through us. Now here it is in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Why are we led by the Spirit? Because he's indwelling us, see? They are the sons of God. Drop on down to verse 16. The Spirit, the Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are already the children of God. And then the next verse. If we're children, then naturally we are what? Heirs. Just as sure as the son is the heir of the father and mother's estate, so we now are joint heirs with Christ, as it says then in the rest of the verse. Joint heirs with Christ, if so be, that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. All right, now let's come on over to chapter 10. I'm going to run out of time. I'm not going to near half of the verses that I really intended to use. But uh, we'll go until the time is gone, and then we'll be ready to go back to the Gospels in our next program. Romans 10, verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Now, he doesn't mention his crucifixion per se, but it's certainly implied by his being raised from the dead. And when you believe that with all your heart, thou shalt be saved. That's a promise. And God can't lie. And then you drop down to verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, let's quickly go on to, oh, let's go into uh, Galatians. Go on through the Corinthians. Let's come to Galatians, one of his earliest letters. Galatians chapter 1. 
beginning of verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, comma. So we go right on into the next verse. Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. In other words, he died for our sin, and he rose again, as Paul said in Romans, for our justification. All right, keep on going to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. What's that a reference to? Well, the crucifixion, his death. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. See, not according to our merit, but our unmerited favor. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. And then come down to verse 12, only for sake of time, that we should be to the praise of his glory, we who first trusted or believed in Christ. Now in verse 13, he says, in whom you also trusted or believed after, after, you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that Christ died, was buried, and rose again, in whom also after you, what? Believed. You were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You won't see that in the gospels. Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. Christ hadn't died yet. And so all of those things had to be held in abeyance until it had happened, and now the apostle can reveal it. And now verse 14, where he writes, which is the earnest or the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption to purchase possession to the praise of his glory. That's Pauline. You won't find that back in the Gospels. And oh, we could just go on and on across the page into Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And then you come down to verse 4. But God, see, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. And then those last two verses that you all know so well, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.